Peter B. Collins. News and comment. It's Tuesday, September 10th, 2019. Halla fucking Lula. Uh, that was my immediate reaction when I read the headline that John Bolton got fired and quit and is no longer the national security advisor to our stable genius president. Yeah. Now, ordinarily, I caution people that exuberance at a time like this should be channeled or limited because there is a bottomless pit of evil people who Trump can summon and who will respond to his call to serve our nation. But I actually think that John Bolton is so close to the bottom of the barrel <laughs> that it is hard to imagine that Trump can actually find somebody worse. No, I, I'm, I'm, I'm prepared <laughs> for that possibility. But at the moment, I am savoring the departure of this hatred, this hawkish man, and I have to say that Trump shows a moment of good judgment. Now, it's only a moment, because when we get into the details of this, it's a he said, he said situation. And the bottom line is that we know that Trump rejected Bolton's advice on attacking Iran a couple of months ago. They sharply disagreed about this overture to the Taliban that was canceled by Trump as he announced that it was <laughs> contemplated. And we also know that Trump hates John Bolton's mustache. <laughs> and so in the hierarchy of White House values, we can't be sure what actually led to this, this break. And uh, there, there, were, there are details here of how it happened. They apparently uh, had a discussion last night. Bolton says he offered to resign, and Trump said, let's talk about it tomorrow. There was a White House advisory that uh, Bolton would be participating with Secretary of State Pompeo and others in a briefing at 1.30 this afternoon. And that, was, uh, that notice was given at 11 a.m. So Bolton said he offered it last night without Trump's asking, slept on it, and gave it to him this morning. Well, in some ways it doesn't matter. It's just evidence more of the bad management style in this White House, the emotional uh, arc of this president's behavior. And so John Bolton is a former national security advisor. He is the third to serve and leave this president in a three-year period. And Bolton, of course, wanted war with Iran. He's a hawkish Zionist supporter of Israel. He wanted to take out Maduro in Venezuela and set the wheels in motion only to see them <laughs> get all bound up and the failure of their effort to install Juan Guaido as the illegitimate president of, Maduro, uh, of Venezuela while bouncing the legitimate president, Maduro because he's a socialist. So Mitt Romney is a sudden uh, lover of John Bolton, quote, a brilliant man with decades of experience in foreign policy. His point of view is not always the same as everybody else in the room. That's why you wanted him there? <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, and then Rand Paul, whom I only occasionally agree with, today is one of them. The threat of war worldwide goes down exponentially with John Bolton out of the White House. I think his advocacy for a regime change around the world is a naive worldview, and I think the world will be a much better place with new advisors to the president. But some things won't change. Trump's belief that Kim Jong-un is going to deliver some sort of a denuclearization program I think is far-fetched. I don't think Trump will ease back on his strong-arm relationship with the despots in Saudi Arabia. I don't think that Bolton had any input on the trade war. Uh, 
maybe to the extent of uh, uh, other aspects of U.S.-China relations. So over at the Washington Post, Aaron Blake tries to get the skinny. So about noontime today, that's between the 11 a.m. announcement that uh, Bolton would be at the 1.30 briefing and then (laughs) the briefing itself, Trump tweeted today, I informed John Bolton last night his services are no longer needed at the White House. I disagreed strongly with many of his suggestions, as did others in the administration, and therefore I asked John for his resignation, which was given to me this morning. I thank him for his service. I will be naming a new national security advisor next week. But Blake asks, if Bolton was on his way out as of Monday night, why did the White House press office not seem to know about it at 11 a.m. on Tuesday? But I think that's common in this White House. Uh, It's all, you know, driven by this imperious and uh, compulsive, obsessive guy. And he gets around to telling, I mean, his press office is meaningless. He tweets. Uh, his, His Twitter account is his press secretary, really. So let them hash that out, and uh, maybe they could get out their Sharpies <laughs> and have, have a duel with Sharpies. Now, one of the issues that clearly led to this breach between Bolton and Trump was this uh, bizarre uh, idea that Trump was going to forge the final peace agreement with Afghanistan and the Taliban. Now, I want to say that I believe the plan was doomed because the negotiations didn't include the Afghan leaders. The Taliban refused to meet with Ashraf Ghani. And so Trump was going to have him in two different parts of Camp David and do some sort of golf cart shuttle diplomacy and force them to accept his brilliance? I don't think so. But I have seen so much hysterical, ignorant reaction. People object that he was going to do it at Camp David. He was going to do it uh, close to the anniversary of 9-11. And these are just things that, that cannot be contemplated in the minds of many mushy people, the mushy minds of many people, let me put it that way. And let's be clear. Even if you believe 100% of the official narrative of 9-11 and what came out of the 9-11 Commission's cover-up, The Taliban was never in any way implicated in the events of 9-11. They were our ally before 9-11, running the government of Afghanistan. We gave them an award and some cash money in May of 2001 for their reduction in poppy exports. Remember that John Walker Lind was fighting for the Taliban government of Afghanistan when he was accused of being a traitor to the United States. They were our ally. And then we turned on them allegedly for harboring Osama bin Laden and launched our assault on Afghanistan. Many people believe the Taliban's responsible for 9-11, that Osama bin Laden's a member of the Taliban. They're all just, you know, jihadis. And so I am linking to a column by Mehdi Hassan, published at The Intercept today, where I agree with everything except his opening line, which was that Trump was foolish to invite the Taliban to Camp David. He writes, inviting the loathsome Taliban to Camp David of all places for a personal meeting with the president, not only in advance of any finalized peace agreement, but on the eve of the 9-11 anniversary, was a dumb and offensive idea. Well, what if it had produced a peace agreement? Again, I I think this whole thing was doomed to fail. But I don't fault Trump for attempting in his own bungling way to try to end U.S. involvement in Afghanistan after 18 years. Because we've been there longer than the Civil War, Spanish-American War, World War I, WW2, and the Korean War combined. And we have burned through at least a trillion dollars. And in the past year, more Afghans have died at the hands of U.S. and Afghan forces than those of the Taliban. So it is a messy situation. 
getting to peace involves compromise and dealing with people you find uh, to be enemies, to be the objects of uh, loathing. But if we keep avoiding the optics of an attempt to extract ourselves from Afghanistan, we may be there for forever. Now, meanwhile, the very first national security advisor of the Trump administration, Mike Flynn, what did he serve? Two and a half months? Even Not even that. Uh, I, I mean, it was two weeks after he formally was installed that he resigned. And Flynn, who has uh, postponed his sentencing hearing before a tough judge, Emmett Sullivan, several times, he has a new team of lawyers, Foxified, and it could be at Trump's behest that they are now looking at ways that Mike Flynn can wriggle out of his plea agreement that was hammered out with Mueller's team. And while I believe that this was a form of entrapment, yes, I think that Peter Stroke went to the White House to ambush Mike Flynn, and he succeeded. I think a deal is a deal. <laughs> and and Mike Flynn accepted it. He was let off the hook for failing to register as a foreign agent and accepting half a million dollars to lobby for the nation of Turkey while he was an, an advisor to the campaign of Trump. To me, that was always a much more serious offense than his phone calls with the Russian ambassador. And over at Consortium News, where they're back online, and I'm glad about it, Patrick Lawrence who is a veteran international journalist, writes about hopeful signs of a thaw in the Cold War 2.0. And he focuses on the aftermath of the G7 summit in Biarritz, France, last month. And he has two quotes from French President Emmanuel Macron. Pushing Russia away from Europe is a profound strategic mistake, said Macron. And... I have another quote from him here. I have to turn the page here to get it for you. Uh, but he also was quoted as saying, the European continent will never be stable, will never be secure if we don't pacify and clarify our relations with Russia. The world order is being shaken like never before. It's being shaken because of errors made by the West in certain crises, but also by the choices made by the United States in the past few years and not just by the current administration. I believe that is a reference to our successful regime change operation in Ukraine. Macron has to be very diplomatic about how he suggests these things. But I take uh, Mr. Lawrence's suggestion here that we may have seen uh, some softening in the anti-Russia stance, and uh, perhaps they will be invited back to the G8 which is now just a G7. But then we have this story of the, uh, this anonymously sourced story that is now in its second day of how we extracted a mole from the inner circle of Putin's Kremlin. And the suggestion that we did this because Trump was so uh, sloppy in protecting classified information. This appears to be another stunt from the intelligence community, in my humble opinion. We are told that the exfiltration took place, I'm reading from the Washington Post here, after an Oval Office meeting in May of 17 when Trump revealed highly classified information to the Russian foreign minister. But listen to this, the next paragraph. That disclosure alarmed U.S. national security officials, but it was not the reason for the decision to remove the CIA asset. But that is the reason that is being dangled in the corporate media to try to make this an embarrassing episode for Trump. And this has the fine fingerprints of John Brennan, in my speculation, all over it. Now we learn that the mole... It was first suggested in December of 2016, while Obama was still in office, to pull him out because the October statement from the intelligence community about alleged Russian meddling may have tipped off Putin that we had somebody on the inside. 
So it says here uh, earlier drafts of a statement. Let's see. That, that is the October 2016 uh, intelligence briefing. All right. Earlier drafts of it had accused Putin by name, but that reference was removed out of concern it could endanger sources and methods. In January of 2017, the Obama administration published what the Post calls a- an assessment that unambiguously laid the blame on the Kremlin, concluding that, quote, Putin ordered an influence campaign. Now, that <laughs> that was a joke. The January 2017 memo was not unambiguous. It was filled with weasel words, we assess and we believe, and this is consistent with other behavior. And so I don't uh, put much stock in this whole story. There certainly may have been a mole. And we may have extracted him. But again, citing the Washington Post here, it was human intelligence that helped the U.S. government conclude so definitively that Putin himself directed the Russian influence campaign to interfere in the 2016 election with the goal of hurting Hillary and helping Donald. And of course, they don't explain how. It just is. And the fact that Mueller couldn't find any criminal collusion doesn't matter because they know right i mean this flies in the face of what has been revealed publicly and i acknowledge that not everything may have been revealed publicly okay but this is a game they're playing a smoke screen and now they're telling us oh because uh, of trump we pulled him out even though that has been explicitly denied and now they're saying, oh, we're blind. We don't have this, these eyes inside Putin's office. A guy who could see what was on Putin's desk? Well, we go to The Guardian, which is a reliable supporter of the Russiagate narrative, a big promoter of the Novichok scandal in Salisbury. And they identify or speculate that the man in question here is named Oleg Smolenkov. He had been at the U.S. Embassy, uh, the Russian Embassy in Washington, and then he got promoted along with his boss, who joined uh, Putin's inner circle. And he apparently did work in the Kremlin. But according to Putin's spokesman, Dmitry Peskov, they confirmed that he worked for the the, the Kremlin, but downplayed his importance. He was a low-level employee, they say, who was fired two years ago. Now, this raises questions of whether this mole named Smolenkov or anything else played the CIA, played John Brennan, fed him what he wanted to hear. Yeah, Putin's directing this himself. Oh, yeah, I saw the documents on his desk. (laughs) So we're in a hall of mirrors, friends. And I encourage you to be skeptical, demand evidence, and not believe just because they claim that the time frame of when they extracted this guy was when Trump was allegedly revealing secrets to Russians. I don't find that compelling. There is no linkage between those two except in time. So uh, this one will probably play out for a while. It is believed that Smolenkov vanished in June of 2017. He went on vacation and never came back. It is believed that he's the guy who is living in a $900,000 home in Stafford, Virginia, that is uh, listed on the purchase agreement to Antonina Smolenkov and Oleg. uh, His last name was misspelled on the deed, or at least on the sales documents. So... Maybe there was a mole. Maybe his name is Smolenkov. But there's a lot more to this story that we don't know than what is being fed to us in the corporate media. And then there is the open question, did Trump ask the current government of Ukraine to go after Hunter Biden? And did he use leverage threatening to cut off U.S. support for the Kiev government? Now, I want to hear the answers to that. Number one, I'm not opposed to anybody 
investigating Hunter Biden's role on the board of directors of one of the biggest energy companies in Ukraine, and that he got that plum uh, job after his daddy did a little song and dance and uh, shook down the government of Petro Poroshenko. So these are legitimate questions, but they get lost in the fog of what I consider to be highly uh, suspicious and speculative reporting here on this claim of uh, the mole in Putin's office and Trump's risky behavior causing the intelligence community to pull him out. Every day I pause for a moment to thank the people who support my work here at the PBC Podcast with your subscriptions. Janet Price, Peter J. Hoffmeister, Jason Ferguson, and Joey Perillo. They all kick in 5 or $10 a month, and I'll bet you could do it too. If my bet's wrong, don't do it. But if my bet's right, visit PeterBCollins.com, find the menu tab, uh, pull on, become a subscriber. You land on the sign-up page, and it's easy for you to set up a new subscription in just a couple of minutes. And if, like others, you're allergic to PayPal, yo comprendo, you can uh, participate by mailing me in the U.S. Post. My address, Box 15660, San Rafael, California, 94915. That uh, lengthy P.O. Box number, and they only use the last three digits, but I have to tell you all six, is 150660. Over at Mint Press News, the founder and editor, Manar Mohawish, has a piece today that I think is worth reading. She asks important questions about the possible U.S. role in stoking the pro-democracy protests in Hong Kong. And I want to be clear, she doesn't say this is entirely some sort of a, an operation by murky arms of the U.S. intelligence committee, a community. But she does raise important questions about the National Endowment for Democracy, about the way it has been used to support different covert operations in the past, and how key members of the Hong Kong protest movement have connections to people like Senator Ted Cruz or Marco Rubio. And Mahawish identifies the National Endowment for Democracy, the soft power tool to influence and interfere in the politics and society of foreign countries. And one of the founders told the Washington Post, a lot of what we do today was done covertly 25 years ago by the CIA. Elliot Abrams is on the board of directors of the NED, along with Victoria Nuland, who was the architect of the Ukraine project under Obama. Since 2014, the NED has officially spent more than $29 million in Hong Kong in order to identify new avenues for democracy and political reform. That'll buy you a lot of face masks, won't it? <laughs> and Mahawish raises questions about Joshua Wong, his meetings with Marco Rubio, and then Jimmy Lai, the uh, millionaire or billionaire, who is the face of the uh, uh, protesters in some respects there. So I, I think these are important questions. And when you compare it to the weak coverage in the U.S. media of the Yellow Vest protests in France and other uh, what appear to be grassroots movements around the globe, I think the questions are quite valid. A judge in Oakland has renewed his national injunction and taken his own stay off it, barring the Trump administration from pursuing its illegal and unconstitutional asylum policies. John Tigger, or does he say Tiger, he says federal laws allow immigrants to apply for asylum regardless of the route they traveled, unless they first entered a country that is shown to be safe haven for refugees, Mexico and the Central American nations that Trump is trying to use don't meet that standard. And Tiger said, a nationwide injunction is supported by the need to maintain uniform immigration policy. And the Trump administration said the ruling is a gift to human smugglers and traffickers. Yeah, the law is immaterial. <laughs> it's just spin. So I believe the Democrats are avoiding impeachment. On the Senate side, 
They've announced a plan to force a vote in the next few weeks to end Trump's declaration of a national emergency at the border. They know they won't win the vote. They want to force Republicans to take a stand after we now know which Pentagon dollars will be uh, diverted from various states to fund this silly border wall. And one of the reasons I am dubious about the dedication of Democrats to impeachment is I saw an interview with the co-chair, the vice chair of the House Judiciary Committee, Democrat Mary Gay Scanlon. I think she's from Pennsylvania. And she breezily said, yeah, you know, we're going to look at all this and maybe by December we'll figure out whether we're going to impeach Trump or not. So meantime, we get nice, pleasant diversions, a draft proposal by Nancy Pelosi that would probably be dead on arrival in the Senate requiring negotiations for drug prices in Medicare, in the Affordable Care Act, and in other respects, too. It feels good. I fully support it. But the real business of the House should be about impeachment right now. I believe it is their legal duty. Now we're going to talk more about gun control. House Democrats will push forward today with a new package of restrictions, including a bill to ban the manufacture and sale of large-capacity magazines. I have no opposition to any reasonable gun control bill. But Trump and the Republican-controlled Senate are unlikely to yield to their (laughs) obeisance to the NRA. New Jersey based on a great story in the New York Times today, is using its clout. They spend, the state spends $70 million a year arming the state police and other law enforcement agencies. I mean, gosh, do they go through that many bullets? Anyway, they also claim they pay more than a billion dollars a year in fees to banks, so they're putting pressure on major financial institutions seeking information that on banks that do business uh, with gun makers and gun sellers. Several major banks have already responded, cutting off banking and credit card services to gun retailers, stopping the loans of money to manufacturers who don't abide by age limits and background checks. And I think this is worth pursuing. I think that, like the angle of requiring gun owners to have hefty liability insurance, It would be void in the case of someone illegally using their weapon, like in a mass shooting. But it would require the vast majority of people to honor those restrictions and would allow the insurance companies essentially to regulate gun ownership where the Congress fails to do so. So I'm looking at coverage of the mob rally that Trump held in North Carolina last night in a last-ditch effort to hold on to the seat in the 9th Congressional District that was the focus of GOP election fraud last year. But the polite Washington Post refers to that race as being upended by fraud allegations. Just allegations. No, it was proven. They showed that the guy who was running the absentee ballot scam gamed the election, and it caused the commission in North Carolina to throw it out and order this rerun. And continuing its polite coverage here, a little bit later in the article, the Post says the elections board found evidence that Dallas, a contractor for the Republican opponent, illegally collected and sometimes filled out absentee ballots. Yeah, it's election fraud, but they can't use that term. We get to hear about uh, false allegations of voter fraud all the time. But when the insiders game the election, it's election fraud, and the media soft sells it. New York Times does the same thing. Their coverage of this race between uh, McCready and Dan Bishop doesn't get to the, uh, the corruption part until about paragraph six, where it says, The state elections board threw out the entire election and ordered a new one after evidence surfaced that Harris's campaign had funded an illegal vote harvesting. It was election fraud. It wasn't just evidence surfacing. And at that mob rally, Trump smeared the survivors of Hurricane Dorian in the Bahamas. 
I don't want to allow people that weren't supposed to be in the Bahamas to come into the United States, including some very bad people, some very bad gang members, and some very, very bad drug dealers. So we're going to be very, very strong on that. Well, very, very stupid. And it's not even accurate. But that's how Trump's mind works. It's how his base operates. And it's disgusting. Meanwhile, former top administer, administrator of FEMA, who was responsible for giving contracts, sweetheart contracts, to friends after Hurricane Maria in Puerto Rico, has been indicted. Her name is Asha Tribble, former deputy administrator for the region. And uh, her apparent boyfriend, Donald Ellison, she steered a contract to his company, Cobra Acquisitions. And this is very similar to the sweetheart deal. Remember Whitefish Energy, that little company in Montana that was going to rebuild the entire Puerto Rican power grid until they figured out that uh, this (laughs) was a scam and they fired them? Well, Cobra got a deal that was virtually identical to the one that was granted to Whitefish. But that's only surfacing now. Bibi Netanyahu is desperate to win his uh, second round re-election a week from today. So he's announced that he'll move to annex much of the occupied West Bank if he succeeds in getting another term. This is just another desperate effort. And he's pretty honest. He said, you know, we've got this opportunity under Trump that may never, ever come back. (laughs) Yeah. That's because it's immoral and illegal. And we believe it was Netanyahu. uh, Some unmarked planes flew into Syria yesterday, uh, killing 18 fighters, probably Israel. And Netanyahu lost his bid to get cameras at the uh, precincts for the election next week. Just part of another scare tactic to use racism to try to bring out his base. I mean, it works for Trump, so Bibi says, what have I got to lose? A couple of quickies before I go from California. Attorneys general from 48 states have announced their plan to launch an antitrust investigation focused on Google. I think that's well-deserved. There are two states not participating so far, Alabama, okay, and California, the home of Silicon Valley, and lots of cash contributions to California politicians. Trump has ordered White House officials to conduct a sweeping crackdown on homeless campments here in California. Now, I think this is just a cynical move to embarrass Democrats. And we've got a serious homeless problem in California. And I would welcome federal help to build affordable housing, to develop programs to house the people who live on the streets. But that's not what Trump is after. He's just looking for a cheap political score. Kamala Harris trying to retool her campaign as it slips in the polls. She is the freshman senator from California, was once our attorney general, and uh, she claims she was really progressive as attorney general. That's not really true, but it has led her to offer plans to legalize marijuana, eliminate the death penalty, end federal mandatory minimum sentence, scrap the cash bail system, reduce the incarceration of juveniles, stop the use of private prisons, and clear the nationwide rape kit backlog. That is a great agenda. But her claim to being the progressive who can carry it out? Not so great, Kamala. And finally, I want to commend Gavin Newsom, the Democratic governor of California who navigated a firestorm. Yesterday, he signed two bills that generally require vaccination of children in California. But it is not a zero-tolerance package. There are exemptions. There are ways that parents can choose not to vaccinate their children. And I don't believe in zero-tolerance. I don't believe that you can force people to vaccinate their children. That's not popular. There are plenty of people who just say, well, uh, you know, we need the herd immunity. But I balance that with a strong support of individual choice. Thanks for listening to my ranting and raving and rambling, my daily news and comment podcast. You can share it everywhere. You'll find it on YouTube. And yes, I am still Peter B. Happy trails to you until... 
again Happy trails to you Keep smiling up 